thought I'd talk about the foundations of mindfulness, four foundations of mindfulness, the Satipatthana. <clears throat> this recognizes the, uh, just the wording of four foundations of mindfulness. So they're objects. They reiterate the position of the subject to the object. They're not my foundations for my personality and me as a person or anything else, but they're, 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 they're the foundations for mindfulness. So they're, they're dealing with the, the body, with this body, <coughs> with the uh, Vedana or the sensitivity, they did not like feeling or sensitivity through the, you have uh, uh, pleasure and pain, attra uh, attraction, repulsion, and neutral feeling. And then through the senses, uh, the eye, when you see something, you see attraction, something, an object can be attractive or be repulsive or neutral. <coughs> or sound through the ear or smell, taste, and touch. Then the jitta, jittanupasana, is the, the mind, the, the mental objects, conditions of the mind, the mood. And then the dhamma is the dhammanupasana satipatthana, is the, is seen dhamma, the, the seeing things in terms of Dhamma, Four Noble Truths, Satipatthana, uh, the Four Foundations of Mindfulness is the Satipatthana, and then the Paticca Samuppada or Dependent Origination. These are Dhamma teachings that are very, they're like skillful tools to reflect and see things, put them in a context, put, put your experience in the context of Dhamma rather than uh, as a context of personal experience. So you have Gayanupasana Satipatthana, which is the body, uh, Vedananupasana Satipatthana, which is the feeling, Chittanupasana Satipatthana, which is the mental objects, and then the Tamanupasana Satipatthana, which is the Dhamma, as in the Dhamma, in terms of seeing the impermanence of the condition and realizing the deathless, realizing non-attachment. And uh, this is uh, Tamanu Pasna Satipatthana. So that which sees, you know, you're taking this refuge in Buddha, so the, this perfect seeing, listening. And you think, where is that? Am I doing it? And then you go into a state of doubt, immediately you start thinking about it. Am I really being mindful or am I fooling myself? And then, uh, so then we, so with thinking is, we, we bring up all the sense of ourselves. That's why one feels despair usually when you think about yourself too much, you get depressed. And thinking, thinking is a function of the mind, so it, it tends to, it, it takes you to being uncertain and doubtful. When you're always trying to figure everything out, you end up thinking, oh, I don't know. You have a, when we're trying to, to answer every question and, and figure everything out, we end up feeling despair and doubt. Because that's a, just saying, like thought itself is a very limited experience. It's uh, one thing when you're caught into thinking, it tend, it tend, we give such importance to thought and, and uh, reason and logic, rational thinking is highly praised in our society. So we, we're educated to think, analyze, criticize. 
and then the result is doubt. And then you have to kind of, you know, grasp things and positions to take and argue them to logically prove you're right. I mean, you find people that like to argue and debate because it gives you a sense of being in control. It's interesting to, to talk to like born-again Christians or Jehovah's Witnesses. Have you ever met any of them? <laughs> <laughs> because they, they come from that. They try to, they, they, there's, there is a logical kind of rationale where you, you, uh, if you, if you, if they can get you to get, uh, believe in their premise, then the logic, then they've got you. Because they, it's a logical system. Yeah, and and the, and so if you if you if they can get you to to agree with their first with their basic premise, then they've got you. And so that this is uh, how they how they operate. It's a very kind of like Jehovah's Witness is a very rational uh, religion. It's not even a religion. It doesn't offer any transcendent experience. But it is a, a system where you, you, you affirm things and believe in things and, and support and affirm each other. So there's this continuous kind of reinforcement going on of affirmation. Of positive thinking helps too to, to just not allow doubt to enter your mind. You say, I believe and, and any kind of doubting, questioning, uncertainty is is the devil uh, uh, tempting you? So these kind of religions depend on a kind of continuous affirmation of the position where we get together and we 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 affirm and reaffirm our premise, our belief, and support each other, and uh, and uh, try to exclude anything that causes doubt or questioning, like excommunicate. Uh, expel, ostracize anything that makes you doubt the premise, the basic premise. Now notice in, with the Dhamma that doubt isn't something we're trying to just suppress and re reject, but we're actually understanding how the mind works, what the doubting is, how it, what, what is it, what it is the result of, rather than just reaffirming or f affirming uh, Buddhist uh, teachings. So doubt is, uh, is um, because it does throw you into a kind of emptiness state, like doubting, I don't know. What should I do? I don't know. And that very, I don't know, I'm not sure, the, the, is a, if you really observe that no, unsurety, insecurity, there's a, there's a kind of emptiness there you can begin to recognize. You're not trying to fill it up with something, but you're, you're beginning to witness and observe the way it is. <clears throat> so that, that position of the knowing and knowing you don't know, knowing uh, the way things are. Like we are talking in the discussion about Jitanu uh, Pasana Satipatthana was a, the mood. And in, uh, in uh, Lumpur Cha used to say, know your, know your mood. Know what your mood is. Don't be the don't be the owner of your mood. Don't become the mood, but know the mood. There's a difference, isn't it? Don't become the mood, but know the mood is an object. So mood is, is uh, something that, using the word mood, English word, translation for arom in Thai, aromana in Pali, it can be, you can be in good mood, bad mood, it can be vague, it can be 
you know, angry, it can be lustful, it can be confused, it can be just unstable, or, or it can be very thick, you can feel very uh, weakened and insecure, you can feel very positive and, and that, but the, that which is observing the mood, the, you see, you, what is the mood that's present? I practice this like I noticed when I used to wake up in the morning that, I, that immediately the mood I was in would be negative. I never liked getting up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when we were, say, when we first lived at Amravati, and then we were very poor, didn't have uh, any luxuries, so, so I lived in these cold rooms. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, in the winter time, and then you'd uh, wake up in the morning in this cold room and, and uh, immediately it would bring in this negative mood. <coughs> and so then I'd observe this mood, just the, the, what negative mood is like, it's like this. Or what is a confusion? What is confusion like? When you feel terribly confused, you don't know what to think, what to do, what's right, what's wrong. Totally confused, uncertain. What is that like as a mood? And you begin to kind of look at mood as an object, as a foundation of mindfulness rather than as a problem. Or some, somebody is saying their mind just wanders all over the place and they, in this retreat they're, in a scattered and going, you know, the scattered kind of mind is just think, think, think and remembering movies and everything. <laughs> 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 what do we do about it? How do we stop that? <laughs> so in the, in the idea to try to get rid of it or, or, uh, make it concentrated. And one can also use, what is it like as a mood? Just this, this kind of restless, wandering, unconcentrated, or kind of willful, foolish thoughts or silly thoughts and whatever. What is it like as a mood? So then you're contemplating it and seeing that even this kind of confused, wandering, uh, mind as, as as a mood is something that is uh, is an object to you rather than than uh, just believing that you've got to get rid of it in order to practice. And I find that a very helpful way of dealing with, uh, especially like confusion or doubt or uncertainty. With kind of amorphous things, you know, the ch- like hatred, anger, these are kind of sharp feelings. When you're really angry or you're really averse to something, you have a kind of sharpness to your mind. You feel alive. Indignation. I used to love indignation. <laughs> <laughs> that, that really got me going. Uh, lust is very lustful, the sexual fantasy and all that is very, it excites the mind. And so that, that is, that excites the mind, That's, that makes you feel alive, you know, to think about sex, or to feel indignant, or angry, or averse. Those two, notice those two are, uh, lust is, is where you, you lose your discriminative mind. Like anger, anger is very discriminative, isn't it? If you think, if somebody did something, to, something and you're angry with them, what do you do? You think, He's, uh, he did that. And then 
And then he, I remember when he said that. I remember when, ten years ago, when he did that. <laughs> you can remember the whole list of, of everything that person does that you, when you're angry with them, that you uh, hate and dislike, everything, every possible thing they've done wrong. Because the, the mind is primed for that kind of uh, activity. You're, you're picking up, you forget all the good things a person's ever done. And you just remember the, the weakness, the faults, the mistakes. And then uh, lust is the opposite. And when you feel lust for somebody, you don't even notice that there's anything wrong with them. <laughs> it totally blinds you to any any fault or flaw or what they've done in the past doesn't matter to you at that point. <laughs> so so last is that is a is a has this blinding quality. It, it destroys your discrimination. And then uh, hatred, anger, is, it makes you very sharp. Makes you very sharp and, and, and critical. So those are the two extremes of, say, mental, of, of, of aramana, of jitta, jitanupasana, where we see the lustful state but we can also contemplate when the when when we have lustful mood, we can contemplate that. We can we begin to see it as an object rather than just be caught into it. And what is it like? What does it feel like? What is it as a mood, as an object? And so you can con you you reflect upon it. And when lust kind of is a, it's always it's a, I've got to get it, I've got to have it. I got, it's kind of a compulsive need to get what you're lusting after. And it's just this kind of intense kind of wanting. And, and then, then uh, anger or uh, indignation is, indignation is a very, can be very self-righteous. And you can feel really, you know, full of, this power that comes from from uh, just hating the and despising the the injustices of the world. Then the the ones that that are vague and amorphous are like restlessness, anxiety, doubt, uh, worry. Dullness, stupidity. None, now, none of us like like to be stupid, do we? I mean, we most of us like to think of ourselves as intelligent, and and, and you know, we, we don't like to think of, or have stupid thoughts in our minds. So, so I, I noticed that that you know, I said this. Uh, I used to just try to, any stupid thoughts would come in, I just, I'd just <laughs> reject, I'd reject them, because I didn't like to, because I identified with my thoughts, and then if I had stupid thoughts, I was stupid. If I had intelligent thoughts, I was intelligent. So when stupid thoughts, or silly thoughts, foolish thoughts, came into consciousness, it just kind of a rejection of it. And then I noticed that in meditation sometimes, that have on this mood where they just be this kind of stupid, uh, dull state of mind, and this kind of stupid things would be coming up. What I what I would call stupid or foolish, or and that's probably you know after years of just rejecting that, then I then in the, with the, the I began to to notice that this was just also a part of one's experience. So then, no, seeing the, the object, see, putting it in that position of a foundation of mindfulness, as the, as the mood is like this, this kind of dull, stupid, uh, gross, heavy, 
uh, dullness, uh, sleepiness, uh, all that kind of thing. It was began to look at it as a as a aramana, as an object of the mind. <coughs> so that helped, and and rather and and rather than just trying to get rid of it, thinking that it's an obstruction to my practice. Is that when you when you're thinking of it as a personal thing, and you think, you you know, you you've got to get rid of these stupid this stupid dullness, in order to become enlightened. So that 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 way of thinking, you tend to resist and try to suppress it. So then, with the satipatthana, you, you begin to relate to it as a as in terms of what it really is. What is subject to rising ceases. I mean, it's. It's, your, it's not a matter of, of making it go, it's just a matter of accepting it, bearing with it, and then it ceases. It's, you're, you're allowing these moods to cease rather than just shoving them out of the way. With, uh, you know, I notice in, in so many people, they have been meditating for a long time. They, they develop, they try to concentrate so hard that sometimes they, they don't. Uh, they, but it's a more of a like becomes a habit of repression. So they're usually bobbing up and down like this. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had one one monk in Amaravati used to as soon as I'd uh, uh, and we have this high seat in a traditional monastery and give a give a sermon you see <laughs> in this high seat and I'd as soon as I'd sit up in this high seat and then I'd go to this and then as soon as I started talking, this, this monk would be going like this. <laughs> so he, he, he said he never listened to me. <laughs> I could see that. <laughs> And as soon as I started talking, he would just switch off, and and he wouldn't know he was doing it. Didn't even know that he was going like this, and the movements were quite, you know, like this. <laughs> but only just little twitches. It, it was real, you know, uh, full body movement. <laughs> and he didn't know that his body was doing that. Well, that's, that's a kind of concentration. It wasn't sleepiness. But it was like up here in the head, <laughs> concentrated up here. And somehow the body had no support for it. <laughs> so you're, you're kind of, and you just concentrate with your brain, and that's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> With Gayanupasana, with the body, like, like notice you're bringing the breath and the body into consciousness. So then you're kind of energizing the whole formation. You're allowing the energies to circulate and to break down the kind of energy blockages in that that we accumulate. Uh, so that it's an integrating process, say, with Satipatthana, with, with, ga, with the body, with the feeling, with the moods of the mind and with the Dhamma. You, you, you know, you're getting a sense of it, of of a, a flow of energy rather than just a shutdown in the brain. <coughs> and this monk had a very, you know, very intelligent, he had a very high IQ. <laughs> but <laughs> not a vast amount of wisdom in it. (laughs) (coughs) 
So doubt is uh, say in the when we have we, we talk about the five hindrances to samadhi, the five obstacles to samadhi are the first one is lust, second is aversion. So those you know are quite quite obvious and quite you know they're they're easy to see and to, and much more easy to deal with in, in many ways where where people get really bogged down is with the third, the tinamido or the dullness, and the utacha kukucha, which is the fourth one, is the restlessness, worry, and mental agitation. And then the fifth is wichikicha, which is doubt. So, so these are the, the last. Notice the first two. Uh, greed and anger, and then the the last three are these kind of amorphous uh, uh, things that we just try to will ourselves out of, just through, through dismissing them, dismissal or repression. So that's why in in encouraging practice is is not to to just try to get rid of these. These are uh, these hindrances, but to really investigate them and to be able to look at them in the right way, rather than just see them as something in your way that you've got to get rid of, which is a personal interpretation. You're you're seeing them as things to learn from. They humble us. They, we must learn from stupidity and dullness, not to become a stupid person, but to recognize the impermanence of these states. So we're not just dismissing them uh, because, because we think it, because it's stupid it's not worth paying attention to, but we're, we're, stupidity is a part of our life. No, it, it's a, a human experience like everything else. So I mean dullness and, and delusion and all that is, is, isn't something to just push aside because we think it's a waste of time, but it's something to to see in the right way. As, so we see it as a mental object. And then uh, mental agitation, worry, anxiety. I mean, we're, we're filled with worry and anxiety usually in, in modern life. The modern life is just a big worry. Even, you know, when, you, when you've got, you, we can take so much for granted in countries like this. So much for granted that, you know, or in, in like in, in Britain, for example, you, you've got a welfare system that will take care of you. So you, you, you can go on employment indefinitely. You can get paid for being unemployed. And so you, we're in Sweden. <laughs> Cradle to the grave, absolute security. When you t tell people in Thailand about Sweden, they all want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great, you know, from the cradle to the grave, you've got guaranteed security. And you don't have to do anything if you don't want to. You can just ride in the system. But then, these countries are filled with problems with alcoholism, drug addiction, mental breakdown, depression, suicide, all the signs of anxiety, worry, mental stress. When you've got this, this guaranteed security for your lifetime, why? And then you go to third world countries where people don't have that security, they don't, they don't tend to have so much depression there. Because uh, they can't afford to be depressed, they have to struggle to survive. <laughs> but sometimes struggling is quite good for us. When life is just laid on for us, and, and uh, we can just take it for granted, there's something in us that we can be, just become dozy and and weak, weakened by that. 
And sometimes when life gets really tough, we have to strive, we have to pick ourselves up, we have to pull ourselves out of it. It's interesting to see modern um, Americans when I was telling somebody uh, about when I was growing up in the 40s and 50s in, here in, in America, the idea then, the idea that everybody was striving for, the ideal home, was this kind of modern house which everything was push button. And we used to fantasize about everything was push button. And you just sat there in this wonderful armchair and, and you push buttons and everything would just come to you. <laughs> Whatever you wish, you push a button and it would just appear. And then, and then uh, to clean the house, you, you push a button and all the dust would disappear. <laughs> you, you wash the dishes, you push a button, all the dishes would be nice and clean, sparkling bright. And they thought, this is, this is going to be wonderful. And of course, you don't, they don't tell you about how these things break down. <laughs> 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 but the idea was that you, that you could just spend the rest of your life in this, in this nice, comfortable chair, pushing buttons, and, and all your wishes just cut me, appearing out of no, you know, and you get everything you want just by pushing a button. And now, life is, uh, you know, we've managed to produce, a, a, you know, this amazing technology. What are people doing now? They're, they're going to fitness classes, aerobic <laughs> exercise. <laughs> they're not sit nobody wants to sit in an armchair. <laughs> <laughs> they? they're, they're, doing, they're kind of puffing away on bicycles <laughs> and, and out camping, going, you know, in, into uh, all kinds of outward bound experiences and climbing mountains and doing everything just to, because life is a real drag if you're just, just sitting in an armchair. <laughs> a couch potato, isn't it? You're just watching the television and pretty soon your mind just, you know, <laughs> you, develop, you develop stupidity as a kind of permanent mental approach to life. So, like meditation, the, the hardship of it is, this is also noticed, like, like somebody was saying, I come on these retreats and I always think while well, I'm here, why did I ever come? <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's emotional, uh, uh, we, uh, we all have, I think, why did I ever come? <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, uh, a few years back, Ajahn Amar and I went for this walk up in the north of England, uh, backpacking. And so we, the day we started out, we took the train to uh, <laughs> Preston, to the, up in Lancashire, and then we, we got up there, and, then, and it was a beautiful sunny day, and we were thinking, this is wonderful, get out of the monastery into nature. And so then the first day, second day was also nice, we walked off into the into the, what's called the Forest of Bolin, which is quite a beautiful uh, wilderness. And then the uh, third day, it started raining, mm -hmm. and it rained, and rained, <laughs> and rained, for about five, six days. And here we were camping out, and I had this horrible little tent. <laughs> somebody lent me, and it was a nightmare. <laughs> it was just for, for sleeping. You couldn't. You could only lie down in it. You couldn't sit up. <laughs> and then, and then it was always leaking. And then you were trying to, in the rain, you were trying to. It was a, you know, trying to maneuver yourself into this tent. Uh, through a kind of narrow opening, but you couldn't get in without bringing all the, the water in with you. So, so after five, six days, everything was soaking wet. The sleeping bag was wet, the robes, the knapsack, everything was, was wet and cold. And I could think, why did I ever come on? <laughs> and then we arrived at, uh, at the Manjushri Institute, which is a Tibetan institute in Cumbria, in the Lake District, which is a beautiful part of England. So, and then that day, as soon as we arrived, 
that morning, and the sun came up. <clears throat> and then this beautiful day, all the clouds disappeared in the sky, and the Manjushri Institute was expecting us, and the Geshe was on retreat. They, they let me uh, use his, uh, his apartment. <laughs> it was put in the Geshe's apartment, and he had a, a shower with hot water. <laughs> and they had a washing machine and a dryer. And, and uh, Nick, the layman that was with us, he took all our wet things and he washed and dried them in this. And you don't know how much one appreciated electric washing machine <laughs> and dryer. And sunshine and hot showers. And it's just like, just filled with this joy and happiness. <laughs> and then the rest of the trip we walked in the Lake District and it was sunny and bright and, and everything was just wonderful. And then, but the memories of this what, are, I think of it, with fond memories, even the wet part. At the time I think, why did I ever come on this? I must be crazy to do this. I think, I'm getting old, I don't have to do these things, these <laughs> young whippersnappers, they <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, suddenly you want to be old so you can have an excuse. <laughs> 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 yeah. Looking back, I just, I, I, you know, I remember, I, I felt, you know, I realized that it was all right. Even the wet part was, I realized I could take it. I could somehow survive, and, and it didn't, I didn't get sick, I didn't die. Uh, I could, I didn't, it, it wasn't really that much suffering, it was uncomfortable, but I wasn't creating uh, a lot of negative reactions in my mind. You just learn to take it, you learn to survive, you don't, you don't, in those kind of conditions, something in you just doesn't go around thinking how horrible it is, you just learn to get on and keep going. And that is a real insight, that even under adverse conditions, there's something in you rises up to it, and, uh, and you don't create suffering around it. Because it wasn't real suffering, it was maybe uncomfortable. But I remember it now with gratitude, and, and I thought it was a really great walk. But I remember at the time thinking, why did I ever come? <laughs> And that happens on, uh, on every walk I've ever taken, when it gets rough and you're out of breath and you're tired, and you think, why did I ever come? But then you don't, more and more you're not trusting in that kind of reaction, because that's what you think when you're, that's the kind of emotional reaction to physical distress or mental anguish or whatever. You want to be, I could have stayed home and watched the television. We don't, I don't, we don't have television. <laughs> I could have stayed in the monastery. And now, Amarvati is quite, quite uh, comfortable. So I've got to stay nice and warm and uh, sit by my fire and meditate on the sound of silence. Why am I out in, this, in these mountains getting wet? <laughs> So this 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 uh, this uh, attitude of of uh, you know of just wanting comfort and security is you know I find most of us really that's not what we want that's not what we want from life I mean and when we do get it 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 tends to be such a it it can be very depressing because depression you find is a problem with middle class people <laughs> and well off people. Because you have time to think about yourself and the world. You can make a problem. You don't have to spend your time just surviving. You, you, have, a time, you have the luxury of, getting, of being neurotic. And uh, when, you're, when you're, say, in a survival situation, you can't afford to, to think about it. You just survive. And that brings out, you find, you know, that we can do, we can survive. We really... And in meditation retreats, that's what you know, we begin to see. We can sit through pain. We can bear with things better than we 
could do, say, if we didn't come to it. We began to to have a sense of our own you know, integrity and confidence that we can take life, we can learn, we can bear with, say, mental anguish or or emotions or physical things that are, say, that we you know unwanted and and uh, painful and distressful. But when we're encouraged to 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 look at them, to accept them, to investigate them, then we're something in us is developing that is isn't just the, that we're not just following, say, the, the easiest way out or the, the most convenient uh, escape. We have to bear with what we think we can't bear. We learn to endure what we think is completely unendurable. So we begin to we feel much more respect for ourselves uh, rather than if we're just chickening out all the time. Every time the going gets rough, we, we, uh, we run away. You know, we, we can't take it. And then we don't respect ourselves. If that's what, how we live our life, we can't respect ourselves at all. We, we feel, you know, a, a, an aversion to, our, to ourselves to oneself. So worry is, uh, in a woman I know was, was uh, worked in Ethiopia during the famine several years ago. And she said, I said, it must have been very depressing to see so much starvation and so much human misery. And she, she said, no, she was inspired because the Ethiopians, they were so noble. She said they were, they were so, they were so grateful for everything they did. And they, they had a kind of dignity and a nobility to them. Because they, they were starving and they were, they weren't asking for anything special. Just, you know, just a, spoonful of rice or something, they were grateful for it. Then she said, if you want to know something depressing, she said, I work for the Educational Authority in London. <laughs> That's depressing. Because then people are envious, they think, I've worked here longer than he has, but he's getting more pay than I'm getting, and, and this and I don't like this, and one complains and whines about this and that. And that, so that you know, we we go back to our apartments or our houses, and and then we can complain and about this or that, about the state of affairs, and we get depressed by that, by the just wallowing in this negativity. So these negative moods are now say we're we're not trying to just be positive by you know developing positive thoughts as a suppressive technique. But also, seeing these, this negativity as a mental object, as jitta, as a, something that, that, you're, that is not yours, it's, it's what it is, but it's no longer grasped, no longer believed in, no longer uh, indulged in, or no longer rejected either. You've seen it for what it really is. Doubt, which you teach her, I've used a lot because I'm a, I'm, if, if I was to sum up myself in the, as a greedy or as a greedy person or a uh, angry person or a delusion, I think was my big problem. That's how I see it. Is in the, in the, they, they, list, they say, uh, the lopa dosa moa, greed, hatred, and delusion. Some people incline more to one than the other two. And so, they say delusion was, uh, doubting, was a kind of wavering, doubting uh, type of mind. And that's why I found Christianity difficult, because I couldn't believe it. It was doubting all the time. Doubting mind. And 
this, this kind of feeling of, and it's a very painful state to always feel this sense of not being sure about anything. I used to really admire and envy people that had confidence, you know, that could be competent and do things. I just kind of shrink into this kind of fog of haze of doubt and lack of confidence. Uncertainty. And so then in, in meditation I became aware of this as a mental object and how to, and, and it also because it, it's, because that doubting state is actually uh, an important, to realize you don't know is, a, is something, is very important realization. So contemplating, like when people say, what happens when people, when, when somebody dies? You know, they want, they want to, what do Buddhists think? When somebody dies, what, did they, what happens? They're reincarnated or they go to some other realm? Or, can you be reincarnated as on a lower level? Then you're reincarnated, you can only get higher, you can't get lower. But there's this other group of theosophists that believe that you can actually be reincarnated on a lower level, as a snake or something. But we don't believe that. We won't have anything to do with those theosophists. <laughs> we believe that you, you reach the human level, and then when you die, you're reincarnated either in the same kind of human state or better. I don't know. <laughs> That's the only honest thing I can say. <laughs> Isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, this is... Uh, it, and then, then you think, what happens when you die? Then, I don't know. I've died. I'm alive. Not <laughs> I can speculate. I can have preferences. <laughs> <laughs> but the honest is I don't know. Is I don't. I don't right now say what hap what will happen to me when I die? I don't know. And that not knowing is the mind goes is is empty, isn't it? It's not you're not trying to fill it up with, with uh, speculative thoughts or ideas. But you can see maybe preferences, like annihilation, just disappear into a void, absolutely blank void of nothingness, oblivion. And then other people find that absolutely terrifying. I don't know what's terrifying about it. it uh, you know, <laughs> all your problems are solved. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, other, other people like to think of it more in terms of, of you know, of, of a state of happiness forever. Like Jehovah's Witness. They, they, they show you these kind of childish pictures of, of what uh, heaven is like. <laughs> and it looks a lot like Washington State. <laughs> mountains, beautiful mountains, lakes, and deer, and, and men and women that are all young and attractive and beautiful looking. Beautiful men and women, and happy smiling children, no lepers, no toads. <laughs> Beautiful swans and deer and flowers and no excrement. <laughs> that's, that's what a heaven is like. Would I want to live in a place like that forever? <laughs> Yeah, pretty boring in terms of, I mean, if that, that's what heaven is like. 
But I don't know, maybe that's what happened. <laughs> 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 but the, this not knowing is a, is a, is, is, means that you're, you're really understanding the, the mind because that not knowing where your mind stops. I call it the non-plussing, where you're, you know, where your, your thinking process packs up. You can't, it just suddenly goes like that, shuts off. And you notice that blank, or the sound of silence. So you're noticing where the thinking stops, and and doubt does that. You think, what should I do with my life? Blank, isn't it? Or what should I? Uh, um, who am I? blank or uh, it sounds like you know maybe I'm getting Alzheimer's disease <laughs> that, that's not what I mean not, not <laughs> <laughs> uh, But it is a recognition, like, because there's that sharpness of knowing, you know, when the thinking, when the thoughts are present and when they're not. So that's mindfulness. Awareness. Who am I? And then there's a, there's a question. A question puts a doubt into the mind, isn't it? What is the, what is the purpose of life? Or, is there a God? Or, will I be, uh, what will happen to me when I die? And then there's a, and you can hear the ringing silence, and the, there's a space there of non-thinking. So you're consciously noticing that. Make that, really notice that. Pay attention to it. So that it's consciously accepted. It's not just overlooked and dismissed. You see, this is very important if you're, for spiritual development, because that tends to get dismissed. We're tending to always fill things up <clears throat> with a lot of ideas and beliefs and doctrines and and just, you know, keeping the mind in, in a very active uh, state, affirmation, uh, busyness, work, hard work, doing something. So even meditation can be just another, you know, busyness of the mind. Busy, busy mind. And then if you like, in, in uh, born-again Christianity, these kind of religions are based on affirmation. Your, your mind is busy all the time. I believe, I believe. This is the right way. Is, is our way the right? Ours is the true way. Are you sure? It is absolutely the right way. Don't you ever doubt it. The devil's out to get you. If you ever doubt it, the devil will get you and you'll go to hell. So I believe, I believe, and then, then you will say, we believe, we believe. <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody back there says, I don't believe that. Get out of here. We <laughs> 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 don't want the likes of you in this room. You'll, you'll, bad influence on us. So the bit mind's busy, but notice this, this non-plussing of the mind, of the thinking process. It is, but there's an awareness of the, of this gap with this space. And I was listening to this tape by uh, Deepak Chopra, somebody, mm -hmm. Sister Jatindriya in Australia sent me this tape, fascinating tape. And, and he ends this, this, uh, his talk on uh, what? How does he put it? Something like the gaps or the silence between the words. He, says, no, he uses the word something like noting, being aware of the silence between words. This is exactly what I, how you know. I could have said that myself. And uh, this uh, the silence between the words, or the the interstices or the emptiness 
noticing, because consciousness will allow us to notice that. You see, like space, like silence. So then you're, what's happening then is your conscious experience is, is it will, will, will integrate and flow rather than just jump from one thing to another thing all the time. The usually your life is, is based on just going from one thing to another thing, isn't it? You, 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 you're doing this, and then you do that, and then you do this, and then you do that, and you, you read something, and then you call your friend on the telephone, and you have a snack, and then you, and then you uh, take a bath, and you're always doing something, and you're thinking about something, or you're listening to something, or you're worrying about something. So the mind is, is always in this, the, the suffering of that is always this kind of hectic stressfulness of just jumping from one thing to another. And so in mindfulness is noticing your, it's not just being mindful of the things, but of the non-things, something and no thing, of condition and unconditioned, of the, of sound and silence, of space, of form and space, of self and not self. So then your consciousness, in conscious experience as a human being, then is, is like you're informing it and you're, you're learning to rest in just conscious, in, in, in learning to be conscious, fully conscious, to the flow of experience that, that, that is affecting the, your, conscious, your consciousness as an individual being. Good and bad is no longer trying to control it and uh, and try to, you know, defend yourself and, and manipulate your mind and run away from things, but it's like you're really trusting in this flow so that even the, the, the cold and the, and the uh, negativity, negative emotions and that are related. Not, they're not just judged as something bad to get rid of, but they're, they're related to their, to their, em- to their emptiness to the to the silence between thought <clears throat> to the the mood that ends and then when when the mood ends there's what's left there's the silence and there's awareness there's silence and you notice that and more and more you really you begin to see it very clearly you you know it it's the direct knowing it's not it's not, you're not making this up. It's not believing in what I'm saying. It's, a, it's, it's real, it's insight. called <coughs> uh, jnana dasana in Pali. Jnana is, is related to the Greek uh, word gnosis. Gnosis is a jnana. And these words convey an insight knowledge, a profound knowledge. So, so this is a, you, this knowledge isn't depending on have, like having a university degree or being able to speak Pali or Greek, but in, in attentive awareness, naked awareness. So that's why I doubt, I've used this, this doubt as a, as a skillful means. So I, I remember when I first started doing this, I, I figured it all out, figured out the Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, figured it out with my intellect. Like now, how do I do it? And I figured out, I was suffering, I could see that. Anicca Dukkanata, I got that. Um, second noble truth, the attachment to desire, that, like, the, the second noble truth is the insight into letting go of desire. So I could see desire, 
I figured that out, all for the desire to become, desire to get rid of, desire for sense, pleasure. You know. And how do you let go of it? And so that was the, that was the uh, koan. And it was like, how do you let go? And so then I said, well, you just let go. But how do you just let go? <laughs> well, you just let go. But how do you just let go? Well, let go and go around with that. Because the thinking, the thinking mind was, was, uh, was trying to figure out how to let go, and and then, uh, and it was, and even though they, it was saying just let go, I didn't know how to do that mentally. Because the, the one was so habituated to thinking and connected one thought with another. So it's think, 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 and it, then you'd end up just going thinking the same thing over and over. And, and so then I practiced then I then I noticed this how do you let go and then there was a the thinking would stop because suddenly you know I wouldn't be so quick to say just let go just it'd be a gap so then I noticed that gap began to meditate on that gap or that space where there was nothing And then that, that became a, an object of, that I use, just the, the gaps between words. And then, so I developed these means of just deliberately thinking, but the emphasis was on the spaces between the words, before I thought it, and between the words themselves, and the end of it. So this is just noting, paying attention, listening to, and then this silence, this ringing silence, I also picked up. So this was like really using the, the, the ringing silence, the sound of silence, the, the space, the gaps, and that as, 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 uh, as an object of meditation. And then, then of course, one, because then when you do that, then you find uh, your mind is, uh, if you can sustain it just for a little while, then you're, you're, you begin to feel that spaciousness as a result. And then you have a context for the conditions again. So I could, I could become aware of, of myself as a person, how that would come and go and began to see just how, you know, my personality, that my ego, me as a person, that all conditioning of, of the sense of myself as a person was something that would come and go. It wasn't, it wasn't like it. Before I just assumed I was a person all the time. And, and I was the same person that was born, you know, back when, and, and then I'm the same person that was born 1934, uh, and uh, it's the same person now, and um, this, this is me as a kind of permanent person. But then, in this, when, they, when you when you when you recognize or acknowledge the space or the non-thought, then there's no person. I can't find I can't find a person in it. It's empty. And then I began to just see I can arise in that emptiness as a person again. If I'm heedless, then I go back into the old ego trips and that of my conditioned personality. But I can also let not do that now. There's more, there's an understanding of how not to get caught up in the old, in the old habits. So that's why in, in this retreat, don't, you know, whatever, whatever is happening to you is, you know, use it. Don't, don't think that it, you know, what's happening to you shouldn't be happening. <coughs> but uh, it's something to, it's something we have to learn from. 
we can learn from it. So if, if your mind is all over the place, filled with the most silly thoughts or whatever, then then that is not, I mean, in itself, is not an obstruction unless we're just caught in the habit of resisting and resenting and wanting it to be otherwise. But because we can look at it in a, as an object, even if it's, even if you only do it for a moment, you begin to get, feel more confident in being able to do this. So don't, don't think that you can just, you know, because you understand what I'm saying, that you can just sit there and just objectify everything for the rest of the retreat in an easy way. I mean, because we do easily get pulled back into the, into the struggle and, and that of these conditions. But you can also stop it. And so trust in the stopping, in the listening, and find the spaces between it. Notice those more rather than just uh, resisting and then indulging in, in these things as a, just as a, without any getting any perspective on it at all except uh, disappointment in yourself for not being able to do what you think you should be able to do. Any questions? I have, um, didn't happen today, but I had it yesterday. I have this doubt thing, and I've had a retreat before when the mindfulness is really strong and it's, you know, like this beautiful state. And then, then the next thing or something that happens in there is, oh, this is all a very indulgent thing, a very contrived thing, but it almost becomes hideous. And, and I, um, I realized that it's doubt. And I, like I said, I, it's like a nightmare I've had this at other retreats. It's just this sort of ugliness that goes on until I realize that's all it is, or, or I, I push it away. It's kind of frightening. And that the whole thing is, it becomes very um, flat. And, and I call that the inner tyrant. <laughs> it's a. <laughs> We have these uh, internal tyrants that aren't going to let us enjoy anything. <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's a you know it, it's a, the the tyrant. There's something within one. I, I notice in myself. It's something in me says, you know, you you know, you're going to have to. And it's always kind of nagging or or spoiling things for me. And uh, it. Uh, so when you, when, uh, you know, I understand what you're saying because you get into a nice, peaceful state, and then, then the time it will come and say, you just, this is, uh, you know, you're being selfish, or you start making a scene about it. You shouldn't be enjoying this, uh, or trying to, or trying to make you feel guilty. Uh, And I think it's like one of the guilt problems that we, that Western people have this kind of obsessive guilt because, uh, you know, I think culturally maybe, especially like Northern Europeans seem to be strong in this way, kind of Puritanism and the work ethic. Uh, like life should never be enjoyed. It should be, it's always, you know, this, is something evil about it, and 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 even though we may not believe that ourselves, it, it can be an underlying feeling of that, and uh, there's something perverse in us that that will keep. Like I find a, a kind of uh, a nagging thing in me that no matter what I do, this nagging thing would say, it's not good enough. And so, I <clears throat> but listening to it, like, in, say, you're giving a, a talk, and then people say, oh, it was a wonderful talk, but this inner tyrant will say, it wasn't good enough. You shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have <laughs> be critical. And it, a real wet blanket, 
<laughs> yeah. Even at the even when when uh, when everything's going along fine, that this this inner tyrant will say it's not you know don't fool yourself it's going to go wrong. <laughs> so it and and so I just began to contemplate this thing this this uh, t- tyrant and and I began to see it's just a habit a kind of emotional habit I've acquired and uh, it isn't anything alive in itself, but it is a habit <coughs> that somehow, you know, there's no way you can please it because it's a dead habit, it's just a reaction. It's not like you can, there's no way you can, can satisfy this tyrant and it'll compliment you, it will only criticize. <laughs> so, so even if, if I should become the best of the best, it will still go on saying it's not good enough. <laughs> so, so that's why by listening, by understanding, and it, it loses its power to influence your consciousness. I don't believe it anymore. I don't listen to it, and I don't, I don't, uh, I, I know it. I'm not suppressing it, but I don't. I no longer get taken over by that force because of understanding it, not to just not to aversion to it, but understanding it. Well, this, the same thing applies really, is to, to, to notice it, to, to objectify it. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, it's a contentment. It can be good. Uh, when it, when it is, say, when it's just complain based on just dullness or laziness or or that then then that then you'd be aware of it as something that is just you know uh, being caught in it. I mean, I've, I remember being a, caught in a kind of complacent attitude for a while in Thailand, and uh, but it wasn't it wasn't. Uh, it was just like it, you, I just become used to monastic life, and uh, and I could just kind of ride in it. And but it, there was no, it wasn't clear or bright. It was more or less just it wasn't wasn't really suffering very much. But it wasn't. I think this nibbana, you know, this kind of it's all right. Kind of wasn't the suffering that I used to have more like swings of emotion than this kind of complacent or dullness. But then that's also a sign that you're, you're, you're working on a subtler level. Because uh, then say the more kind of emotional swings of extremes isn't so, isn't such a big thing anymore. And then you're, there's a, you're working with a subtler kind of uh, mental conditions. That's why I really develop this reflectiveness on them. Listen to them, and not not judging, but just observe and uh, feel feel it. And then more and more that if it's just dullness or or a, a kind of negative complacency or just in kind of uh, bland indifferent then you'll you'll also find you'll see how to relinquish that or resolve that tendency
good when suddenly something really gets you going. And like, uh, something usually happens and, and you find yourself getting all worked up over something. <laughs> Yes? I really appreciate your, your talking about the chanting this morning because it's, it's helped me a lot when you were talking about um, the meaning. And uh, I think I had trouble with that. But I wish you could have illuminate for me the bowing. I, 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 have, I don't think I can bow well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like the bowing is a uh, is for mindfulness also, using the body in a mindful way. So, and it's a it's a sign of respect and humility, where you like you're putting your head down on the floor, and and uh, doing a, a kind of prescribed way of <coughs> of bowing, and it's a uh, one can do it in a perfunctory way, or not do it, or do it mindfully. So in uh, in the monastery, I mean, we we were expected to do it. I mean, it's part of a tradition. So, and if you didn't do it, then you know you felt the pressure, group pressure on you. <laughs> but. Um, then Ajahn Chah used bowing as a kind of as a as a mindfulness practice. So he'd he'd have us one encourage us to bow a lot. So we'd uh, when we'd enter the room and say our our kuti, we'd have to bow, and when we took leave of our kuti, we'd bow. When we enter the meditation hall, we'd bow, and then we'd bow to him, and then we'd bow to maybe. Um, picture of Ajahn Man or something like that and then then uh, we'd, we'd get up at the end and we'd bow then we'd go back to our room and bow we'd go to the dining hall to eat we'd bow before we ate and then when we finished we'd bow and get up and <coughs> so and then this bowing became almost uh, yeah, I mean one became obsessed with it and I began to feel guilty when I wasn't doing it <laughs> Because, like anything, it can be uh, another, you know, it's how, you know, with any any convention, it, the grasping of it is the problem. But then, so so this is where, you know, with mindfulness, like like in the Vinaya, the monk's discipline, they tell you when it's appropriate to bow and when it's not. So, they're like, uh, and you're supposed to take this into account the time and place and the appropriateness and and uh, somebody I was at my sister's last week in in Vancouver Washington and and uh, you see my sister doesn't bow to me at all <laughs> <laughs> and her husband won't either I mean, not, I mean, not that I've even suggested it, but, <laughs> but somebody came to see me and they got down on the floor and bowed to me and I was thinking, you know, the, here's my sister and her husband looks at <laughs> <laughs> And I felt a bit silly, you know, because <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't the, I mean, it, I appreciated the, the person's respect, but, you know, it really, in that situation, it wasn't it wasn't an appropriate thing to do. I mean, it wasn't wrong, but, but I mean, this is where we we uh, you know, I mean, it, it's it's just to to be able to to use wisdom to to figure out when it's appropriate and when it's not, rather than just think I've got about Arjun Tomato, and then you know, so then you another time. Mark Lieberman, we were, it was in England and he, we were, 
we took him, he's going back to America, so we had this van, minivan, and we we were we taking him to Heathrow Airport. And he got out and and there out on the pavement with all the taxis and the <laughs> <laughs> He got down and bowed to us in the van. You know. <laughs> and then the and then the uh, the man driving the coach in front looked in uh, effing so and so. I one one was is you know it, it is a. Uh, it's very touching uh, to see somebody do that. I mean, it, for me, you know, it's uh, the people will will respect you so much that they want to do that. But but uh, also, I mean, it's not it, you know it's not necessary it's to to feel that you have to. I mean, this is where you 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 do uh, you you know the time, the place. Like if I'm if I'm eating food and. And uh, then, uh, you know, if, if it, then if I'm supposed to stop and and and, and that, then it's you, you know, if somebody's eating food, or if I'm on the toilet or something, it's <laughs> 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 quite obvious. <laughs> But as a practice, it it uh, it does, you know. I, in uh, in um, Tibetan Buddhism, they have to do how many of these prostrations, mm -hmm. hundred thousand prostrations, and and that that's a very good, skillful kind of exercise and commitment to uh, to doing to using your body in a, in a, in a devoted way. And some people think oh, that's a, a bunch of rubbish. There's, Hundred thousand prostrations. I think that's very good. I mean, I, in the Tibetan tradition, I think it's a very good thing to do. Because I know people have done it, and it and it really is, uh, you know, like especially when you're young and you have a lot of energy. <laughs> and so you're using the energy. It's a good exercise, and also done with devotion, and done mindfully. Then it, it's a it's a skillful thing to do. But then it becomes superstition when you think you're going to, you know, that you're doing it to gain merit points up in heaven or something like that. But uh, it's uh, bowing to. I remember when I first had to bow to a monk when I, when I in Bangkok and. Uh, I was practicing meditation at, at a monastery, a big temple in Bangkok, and it was the birthday of the head monk. So I was making lots of money there in Bangkok, and so I thought, well, I'll, give, I'll donate some money to the temple on this monk's birthday. So I had this money, and uh, and they're having this kind of meeting with this monk, and I was there, and so I said I wanted to give this money to the monk. and. They say, oh, uh, give, go up and give it to him. And they, and they say, uh, but bow first. And I didn't know how to bow. And suddenly I just froze. You know, I just froze. And, and bowing. And I didn't know how to do it. So I, I, I waited a while to watch other people to kind of get the idea how they were supposed to do it. <laughs> and then finally they kind of pushed me a bit. And <laughs> I went out and... Uh, and I did it all wrong, you know, I did it in a funny way. And, and, then, <laughs> and then everybody started giggling. <laughs> and, and I felt so humiliated, really humiliated. Uh, because I felt, you know, I made a fool of myself and lost my dignity and all that. <clears throat> but it was a, a, you know, that was the initial attempt at bowing. And then after that, it. Once I learned how, and and I began to do it, then it was second nature. 
to me. But it is hard when you when because we're not you know in the state, for example, we don't bow and that. So it's, it's a completely kind of strange thing to do in terms of our own culture. And uh, so there is you know a natural resistance to it because it it's not a part of our cultural values bowing. So that's why it's uh, you know peop- you can see why people you know, find it or resist it or feel ill at ease with it because it, it, it isn't, it isn't part of something that we, we uh, as a culture, we, we feel, uh, uh, we have a feeling about it. Usually we regard it as superstition or like bowing to graven images from the Old Testament. Thou shalt not bow down to any graven image. And here we're bowing down to that's a graven image. Here we're doing it. <laughs> now what's God going to do now? <laughs> Thou shalt not bow. <laughs> so then, then we, uh, you know, there's a kind of fear, even, even though you think, oh, it's a bunch of rubbish. It's still, it's still a cultural thing of thou shalt not bow down. And uh, so then uh, somebody asked me that once when they came to Chitters, uh, this big golden, very big golden gilded Buddha Rupa. And they came in and they saw us all kind of bowing to this golden image. Oh. <laughs> and and then they asked me about bowing to graven images. And so I, I was, it helps to reflect what you're doing, you know, because, uh, you know, that's a, that's a commandment. But it's, it's, you know, it's not so much bowing or imagery that's the problem. It's the belief in the image, in superstition. But when you're paying respect to what is true, like when we bow to the Buddha image, we're not bowing to it like it has magical powers, that it's Buddha or that it's God or anything. It's a symbol. We know that. We're not saying it's, it's anything but a symbol uh, that reminds us of awakenness and mindfulness and Buddha, Dhamma Sangha. So then it's, it's used as a skillful means to awaken or remind ourselves of what we're doing. But the Old Testament commandment is is about you know bowing down to you know images and and that uh, out of uh, ignorance and superstition, not not to mindfulness and wisdom. So it does throw you in you know open up different ways of looking at things. Like like it's really the mind, human mind is once you begin to understand how your mind works, then you find this. Uh, amazing malleability of mind where you can look at things in different ways you're not just conditioned into a one way of thinking or or seeing life you you begin to you you have the you know we can look at at you know in different ways we can examine because we we know how our mind works we're not just stuck with a set of conditions and uh, that that we're grasping, and then that means anything else is 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 seen as a, a threat to it, because the liberation of the mind means that then you know we we begin to understand uh, and appreciate all religions, not as just some kind of uh, ecumenical tolerance, but and, and you begin to know how to relate to religious experience and how different different religious conventions, uh, you know. To me, they're pointing at the same thing. They're just different angles, different perspectives in, in terms of the, the conditions or the symbols they might be using. Um, with that thing about bowing, I'm, I'm Jewish, and I think no matter how Buddhist I'll be, I'll always be Jewish, and there is a difficulty 
So there, there, there has to be a way to um, not push that difficulty away, being aware of it and working with it. But it, it is still difficult to me, especially with the statue. Right, because that's very much ingrained in the as Rishi in, in, in Judaism, it's like God's commandment. So I mean, it's uh, but this is where you, you know, because you're still seeing it from a, you know, it's bringing up an emotion that that you have, and so you can contemplate that, and because then you can. Uh, you know, it's not a matter that you have to do it, but it's also you begin to see how to do it if you want to do it in a way that isn't bowing down to graven images in the in the way that God forbade. But you know, is that God was pointing to in the Old Testament as something that was superstition, that wasn't just images or bowing. That's the problem. But the we can say. People now bow in, you know, to grave an image like the banks and the, you know, their what they worship is like the gold and silver in the banks rather than a, a golden calf or something. Those are the dangerous ones. It's more like the materialism, you know, worshiping uh, materialism rather than. I mean, we're sophisticated enough to not bow to golden calves but we aren't sophisticated enough to see through a lot of materialism I have friends in the in the third their seats and uh, whenever I'm there we go to the temple several times and when they bow they explain to me that they, they put their forehead on the ground and remind themselves that they came from the earth and then return to the earth so it brings up their mortality and if you know you're going to die kind of takes a little punch out of your ego. The other thing is knowing that you're going to die gives you a finite time that you have to work on your stuff. So it's to uh, reinforce that um, today when they're, they're praying, you know, they're meditating, that it's, it's a special time. So I kind of like that, and I, I always think that, you know, I'm going to die, so I only have so much time to live here. Yeah, that's, see, that's very helpful. It's using it like that. Okay. 